we are at the Boston International Antiquarian Book Fair. It's uh, November 16th, and uh, it's 2019. And our next interview is with Kylie Sams from the Rutenbergs. Okay, Kylie, here's some questions I want to ask you about friends and family. Uh, what does your mom and pop do? Do you have siblings? What school did you go to? Um, that kind of so I'm from North Carolina originally. Uh, my mom is an elementary school vice principal. My dad was in the Marines for 20 years and he's retired now. Uh, I grew up an only child, much to my dismay. And I went to Duke University for my undergraduate degree. I have a bachelor's degree in history and classics. And then I went to Fordham University in New York for my master's degree in medieval studies. Medieval studies? Why did you choose that? Is that the thing that you really enjoy? It's the thing I really enjoy. I had always thought I would go into archaeology, ancient history, and classical languages is my passion. And I always figured that I would dig and be a professor or something that allowed me to dig. But I went on a couple of digs and realized that I am not built for that work, A. It's very strenuous, isn't it? <laughs> it's very strenuous, and uh, if you are not a burly human being, your job is to dig out the ancient toilets. Oh. So I found myself in a hole most of the time. Not, no. not ideal. Uh, and I, I was always frustrated that no matter how well the dig goes, no matter what you find, no matter what incredible discoveries you make, you are always interpreting things with your own contemporary notions, ideologies, opinions, and you might be completely wrong. There's no way of knowing if you are right about the things that you're finding, about the uh, ideas that you have about buildings and walls and streets. And when I was in college and I started taking classes on medieval manuscripts and early printed books, I realized there's an entire field of artifacts, of historical artifacts, that tell you what they are, that you don't have to interpret. <laughs> So that's what got you. That's what got me into it, uh, and I always loved uh, manuscript illumination and yeah, and and uh, Latin paleography is a special passion of mine. So when I was in graduate school at Fordham University, I volunteered uh, for a year at the Morgan Library and Museum in their medieval and Renaissance manuscripts department. It's a hell of a library, isn't it? it is, uh, and they did not have an internship open, so. Oh. I, uh, I, I walked in of my own accord and basically said, here's what I can do, give me work, I'll do it for free. And they did that. <laughs> Which, free, that's my favorite full little it, word. Yeah, with. but I, I, I essentially wanted to access the collection, wanted to handle the books and manuscripts and said, let me work for you so that I can do that. And I worked for uh, Roger Wick, in, and he's the curator of medieval and Renaissance manuscripts and I did transcription and trans, uh, translation of bibliography mostly, and he paid me for my time by showing me how to read manuscripts and how to interpret them. That's more valuable than Much, much more. And uh, that led me into realizing that curating and, uh, and librarianship as important and rich and delightful of a field as it is, is mostly paperwork and that's not what I wanted to do. <laughs> and about the same time when I was in grad school, I also realized I didn't want to be a professor at all. So I sort of thought, how do I continue to work with books and manuscripts? How do I continue to handle them and experience this world without teaching and without curating? And that's what led me to the trade. What's the timeline on this? How did you graduate from the I uh, got my master's degree in 2013. Okay. And what did you do after you had your master's degree? After I had my master's degree, I went to work for Bruce McKittrick, uh, McKittrick Rare Books in Pennsylvania. I worked for him for four years, and then I went into an auction house, and I was head of uh, books and prints at an auction house for two years. Which auction house? Uh, William Bunch Auctions and Appraisals in Chadsford, Pennsylvania did that for two years until uh, my husband finished his PhD and got a job at Duke University 
and that's when we moved to Durham, North Carolina, and Howard Rutenberg was interested in opening an office there because his daughter already lived there and already worked for him. Right. So it just worked out seamlessly. So you've been uh, you've been in North Carolina since. You, you're still there around too. Still there. My daughter, my granddaughter, played uh, plays soccer for Syracuse, and so uh, Duke's on their schedule every year. Yeah. So I Same. enjoy going to those games, so even though she's up in Syracuse. It's, it's it's a much more pleasant climate at Duke than in Syracuse. I would think so. I would think so. And my, one of my uh, nieces graduated. And she was a swimmer. She went to Duke on a swimming scholarship. And she graduated from there. And went on to be a uh, medal winner in the Maccabee Games when she graduated. Wow, well, great. We, we got you figured out now. <laughs> you, you're in North Carolina. I am. And Howard is still in California, isn't he? Howard and Barbara are in California. California. Madison Rutenberg, third generation Rutenberg, and I are both in Durham. Right. So we have a little satellite office there. Uh, other than Howard, uh, are there any other dealers you can think of who have had uh, influence on you? Absolutely. Um, my favorite thing about the trade, honestly, is how supportive and nurturing and mentoring the women in the trade are. The women who've been around for a long time, I always expected it to be a competitive environment, that it's, it's gotta be intimidating to see young people coming in and starting to have an active role in a business that they worked a lot harder than we did to get into. And that has never been my experience. They have always been just absolutely as supportive and helpful as they can be. So Nina Musinski uh, gave me a lot of advice when I started out and I really appreciated it. Uh, Joyce Gloss from the Brattle bookshop Joyce, Joyce is very nice. has always been, she's always been helpful about how to communicate with clients. She's a, she's a, she's a ball of fire. She didn't used to be, but since, uh, since uh, Ken's father died a number of years ago, she has become more of an active participant yeah. and a driver. She, she's got that drive you got to keep her happy. Yeah, oh, yeah, really. <laughs> uh, Shayla Martian, uh, she's, <laughs> she's one of the most brilliant human beings oh, I've ever Shayla, met. Shayla's wonderful. Yeah, uh, so, but, I mean, obviously, I learned so much from Bruce in, in my time there. But I've got to say, uh, the, the, the women in the trade have been just a wealth of, of oh, aid. Yeah. There's a lot of knowledge, there's a lot of, I think that one of the things that I really enjoy about the trade is sharing. People sharing experiences, sharing, uh, you know, don't go to this bookseller because of this. You, when you're in the city, make sure you see so and so. And that kind of sharing didn't happen uh, back in the 50s and 60s because everybody was afraid that somebody was gonna take their customer, somebody was gonna buy a book that they wanted, and nobody, nobody shared, nobody did anything that was constructive. There's enough to go around. <laughs> yeah, plenty of that to go around. Um, are you a computer person? No. <laughs> no, no. So you're a bookseller who uses a computer. I, I, I know that technology and computers are a necessary evil in our, <laughs> in our craft. Uh, I, I use a computer probably more adeptly than some of the elder statesmen of the trade, yeah. but I am in no way fluent in the language. <laughs> no, it's, it takes a while. Anyway, um, so another question I'd like to ask you. Is it tough for you to use the computer in the, in, in the business world? I mean, there are so many portals that you can put your material on, but the kind of material that you deal in, I would think would not lend itself to the, to the internet. Or does it? Uh, well, it depends. There are plenty of aggregate databases that we have to use to establish uh, uniform titles, authorship, imprints. Um, the OCLC database, obviously, to locate how many copies of a particular book, how many editions are out there. The uh, American Book Price's current subscription-based database for when was the last time this came up at auction and how much did it go for. Uh, the CERL thesaurus for establishing imprint uniformity is has been really useful. Um, obviously, ABE Books and Via Libri allow us to see if our copy is the most expensive one on the market, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> which always, it shouldn't be. <laughs> you, know, you always try to be a little bit less than 
the, the big guy or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I, I've got to say, I, I kind of hate what... I, I was never in the trade, obviously, when the internet wasn't a part of it. Right. And I wish I could have experienced that because I feel like the internet has... Uh, it, it has quantified a lot of the data that used to be uh, that, that, that used to be ephemeral. Um, it would be really nice to be able to sell a book to someone because they really liked that book, not because it's the only copy in the U.S. or because it's the cheapest copy on the market. And having a tablet or having an, a laptop or an, even an iPhone with you at a fair allows you to access all of that information immediately so the conversation that you have with the clients and with collectors has been stifled, I think, in a large way by the internet because you're not able to... Ex Hi. Hi. Okay, okay. For those who, who uh, aren't seeing everything, a uh, carriage just came in. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I was going to tell you is that uh, there's a formula that I was taught about the internet. When you put something on the internet, it should be the cheapest copy, the best copy, or the only copy. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense to do it. Absolutely, absolutely. And the, those are words that, of, of wisdom. Do you know those, those true words? I've heard that. I, I, I almost want to say it sounds like Tom Congleton said it, because the other tri tri trinity I've heard is the way to get out of a book fair, and that's you buy your way out, you sell your way, way out, out, you drink your way out. But that's, <laughs> yeah. well, that, that's old school. Or eat your way out. Yeah. Yeah, eat exactly. your way out yeah, is better. Exactly. <laughs> better. Uh, you want to take over from here? I'm just, Absolutely. I'm just down in, uh, I'm down to like this area. Oh my gosh, here. okay, yeah, you know. I, I, I move right along. You move right along, I know, I stay sometimes on these you, points. You like the kibitz, so, so I like the kibitz, exactly, so today. Um, you're, so you're at this like legacy firm now, which is really incredible. But as a young voice curator, discerner, uh, dealer in the trade, if you were to take um, kind of like the body of the Rutenberg firm, and if you were to say right now, if they were as young as you are and they were entering the trade, how would they do it differently, do you think? How would the firm enter differently? Because it looks so different now, the landscape. Yeah. It does. It does, and it, and obviously the Rutenberg, uh, the Rutenberg firm has changed so much over the years. Yeah. It's, yeah. Barbara started it fifty years. Next year will be fifty years yeah. wow. of Rutenberg. Wow! And she started out just doing history of medicine and science, right. and now we do sort of everything. Um, and and her starting out as a woman doing science and medicine made it so incredibly difficult. Mm -hmm. I know and. Especially at that time. At that time, exactly. And she has crazy stories about things that were said and, and thought of her and of the business. And, and obviously we're not doing it that way anymore. We, we do a lot more of uh, sort of a general, uh, general collections. And we now that Madison and I have a satellite office from the Sherman Oaks location, we're able to have a lot of autonomy mm -hmm. over how we handle business and what we do. And I think that, I think it is important to establish yourself as a type of dealer if, if, when you're starting out. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't go to someone who's just starting out and see, if I, if I go to someone who's just starting out and I see both Harry Potter and an incunable in their booth, I think this guy has no idea what he's mm -hmm. doing. And so I think it is important to start out sort of, uh, in, in a more of a niche, but I think that being able to have a general appreciation and market for books after you've already established yourself is so important, and it lends itself to a lot more, to a much richer mosaic of clients, mm -hmm. of, yeah. of, of buyers, of, uh, yeah, of, of people we buy from. So I would, I think I would have liked to have seen sort of a branching out earlier if I were to. Right have started it out. Yeah, it, it, it can help so much to establish yourself with a very unique and um, distinctive voice, mm -hmm. but it does, I don't want to say pigeonhole, but it almost can pigeonhole because you want to you want to maybe have the opportunity to have say yes to a different house call, to say yes to a different collection coming exactly. your way, and to say yes to a different collector when they assume you don't have A, B, or C, 
And you're exactly. like, uh, actually, come right this way. We do. Come well, take a look at how we've interpreted that genre for you, you know, maybe even. Exactly. Well, and Madison and I have, we, we're doing a lot of literature. We're doing a lot of uh, feminist uh, mm -hmm. science. We, we have a collection of feminist science fiction. Right. And uh, we're doing an animal rights activism collection. Mm -hmm. And we're doing, we're doing a lot of witchcraft in the cult. Mm -hmm. And that's not something that anyone has ever known Rutenberg for. No. So when we, bring, right. when we bring those things to fairs, they don't get purchased. Right. Because that's going to take a while. It is going yeah. to take yeah. a while. And, and we're going to keep trying. Mm -hmm. and, and we're going to have to establish ourselves as a voice of general interest. But it, I, I see those, you know, the, the people who would want my astrologer's magazine mm -hmm. are not coming mm -hmm. to our booth. Uh, they're, you know, the people who want the Vesalius are mm -hmm. coming to the booth. Yeah. yeah, so there's that, that, that distinction and that, like, dance, building that tapestry in one firm or within one person's shop is, it's really, it's interesting and it's tricky. Did we... Um, You've got to be using social media, though, to help paint that picture, I'm sure. We are. Yeah. We are. And we're also, uh, since Madison and I have the satellite office, we're trying to carve out sort of the the Rutenberg name has always done business with institutions. Mm -hmm. right. And how, how, well, Howard has a lock on selling $10,000 books yeah. to libraries. Sure. No problems there. And Madison and I are trying to sell to young people and collectors who are trying to build collections. Mm -hmm. Something that we really want to do is help people build their collection mm -hmm. and be, pe be someone that, uh, that an that a up and coming collector can call and say they would like us to help them locate these books that mm -hmm. will fill out the holes in, in their inventory. So, Development. yeah, Major. so we are, we're doing a lot of sort of not necessarily commercially successful ventures, but things that get our names out there. We're working with uh, local businesses doing pop-ups yes. where we, yeah, where we go to you know, a vintage clothing store or a woodworker mm -hmm. and say, for one weekend, we're going to put our books in mm -hmm. a corner of your shop mm -hmm. or you build bookcases. Can we put a bunch of books on your bookcases for mm -hmm. a few days and we'll be there and mm -hmm. we'll bring food and alcohol mm -hmm. and give you 10% of what we sell. Mm -hmm. And that's a really good way, I think, of, of showing people that this is an option and you can you can come to us in a, in a non-formal setting. <laughs> yes, exactly, yeah. It really kind of brings, uh, dials away the mystique and makes it accessible for everyone. Exactly. But, and it is, Every single person out there from, you know, from 15 to like 95 has, there's an angle in for them to be fascinated by something on that shelf. Our, and when you put it right in front of them, yes. they're totally turned on by it. Our, our new tagline that we're going to put on t-shirts and yeah. cell phone cases and tote bags is there mugs and mugs and mugs, yes, and mugs. And mugs. Is, <laughs> there's a book on that. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yep. That's awesome. That's a good tagline. Is this, is this your first book fair? No. Oh. Okay. <laughs> uh, which ones have you done in the past? I've done Boston several times, New York, uh, the Bibliography Week, the uh, iLab mm -hmm. Fair. Uh, I did LAX. Um, some some smaller fairs, yeah, satellite but satellite shows yeah. and stuff. Like you meet a lot of people at book fairs and you learn to, you can buy a lot of stuff, you can sell a lot of stuff, or it could be like a big zero too, you just hang out. Well, it's important to remind people you're still alive. That's why I do this book fair. <laughs> yeah. I don't make any money, I lose money, but at least people know that I'm still alive mm -hmm. and I'm still doing business and here's what I have. Yes. And being in front of the material with the face or the voice that is... Yeah that's kind of like writing the, with the material is, is important. Um, people may see the, the great catalog and they may see that outreach that's done digitally, mm -hmm. but putting the face with the name and the name with the face and who, who it is that's, you know, writing the, the copy, if you will. Yeah. I think that's so, so important. It is. It's very important. Yeah. And the, it, 
in in these fairs you meet the the next generation you know mm -hmm. you you have the curator who brings their new assistant who's going to take over mm -hmm. or you see the established collector who brought mm -hmm. their son who is going to inherit the collection mm -hmm. and you, you meet the the people who are just triaging the trade yes, exactly. <laughs> before before they sink their feet in completely and that's so important for establishing the network and speaking of that I mean, so this is like the whole ecosystem, and we can kind of see it, you know, because we, we can look backwards historically, and you're, you know, young and vibrant, so you've got your finger on the pulse of the right now. So if we were looking and prospecting and looking in that crystal ball into the future, um, what do you think the challenges are for, and the challenges are going to be different for all, each, you know, each yeah. generation, each right. genre, but some of those challenges that face the trade and what we can do, I think we're doing it, you're doing it, <laughs> to overcome it and to, you know, not to lament things that could go wrong, but where do we see challenges and successes? Well, obviously the advent of digital humanities is, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's seen as such a competitor with us as, a, as booksellers. Mm -hmm. I don't think it has to be. Mm -hmm. I think that we need to learn how to welcome digital humanities into the trade and work with libraries and collectors and curators to show them how it is important to have the materials mm -hmm. and how to sh present them in a digital format. I mean, having the having the physical thing is obviously going to be, be always going to be better than having a facsimile on your computer, but not everyone can access that not everyone can access yeah. the thing, so I think we need to start uh, start building the tools for how to talk about our books as a as a component of digital humanities rather than a competitor of right, digital as humanities. Right, like a cultural oh. asset. Exactly. And there are definitely things, as you well know, working with so many primary source things at such a high level, that can only be gleaned from the materiality and the physicality of that particular artifact. But then it can inform, like a you know a mega database that is that's you know um, parsing out data for the researcher to use in a really yes. dry, flat, if you will, way. But it came from and it originated from this actual thing. So nobody in Egyptology would say, well, we never actually have to handle the thing. We never actually have to look at the full spectrum of, you know. <laughs> well, for instance, we have. Yeah, I know. Yeah. That's why I brought it back to that. Yeah. Well, for instance, we have we have a couple of herbals and a bug book right now in the booth yeah. that the herbals have pressed flowers in them. The bug has a dead moth that yes. has been mounted. You can take a photo of that, sure. but it, you're not going to be able to glean all of the information available from having those specimens mm -hmm. on a screen. So. If you can't come and see the dead moth, mm -hmm. okay, we'll take a picture of it for you, but it's always better if you can come see the dead moth. Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't I? I can think of a thousand reasons why I wouldn't. <laughs> well, that sounds like an amazing full circle, yeah. you know, for, for the Rutenberg firm. Yeah. And uh, I've, that's known, I've known Barbara for, I don't know, 40, 50 years. She's changed something. No, no she know. hasn't. <laughs> no. In her attitude and her way of doing things, right? Uh, she is a she's a force to be reckoned with. But uh, I I feel very very blessed to be part of this uh, in incredible legacy and yeah. to have the autonomy that Madison and I have moving forward. Of you know, tell us what materials you need. We will provide them and trust that you are going to do your best with them. And and that's really the the situation we're working with. We. We're hoping in a year that we can open up uh, an event space and gallery. Mm -hmm. It won't be open to the public, but we want to do uh, we, we want to do book club nights. We want to do author reader readings. Mm -hmm. We want to do potlucks with librarians. Mm -hmm. You know, we have all of these great ideas of ways that we can bring people who don't have their own collections in to see what you can do with books and how you can have fun with books and have fun with book people. Yeah, bring them to the table. Exactly. It sounds so, like, it's like kind of like the bookstore model without the bookstore. Because you don't yes. necessarily want to have seven days worth of staff from eight to six. No. But I like to say, I want the perks. 
of yes. what that community brings. Exactly. So it and sounds like you're going to do it. it. And we have so many great ideas. We're going to do, we want to do yoga using books as yoga blocks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're, we, we want to do collaborations with local breweries and wineries mm -hmm. to create book themed beer and wine mm -hmm. and <laughs> we, we have all of these great ideas and it's just a matter of time right now we're building the infrastructure yeah. we're uh, cataloging an inventory so we have a uh, stock to pull from and we don't have to plan months in advance to make these things happen yeah, exactly well it sounds like the building blocks are they are well they are well forged in, in North Carolina. <laughs> so Come visit us. <laughs> coast, coast to coast, coast to coast. Well, it's exciting times yep. for everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. You're welcome. Fastest half hour in TV, huh? <laughs>